Welcome to the podcast, Melody and Friends, where I will be taking a virtual tour around the world and interviewing all kinds of wonderful people. And today we land in Alabama to talk to my good friend, Sherry Tate. And this is actually going to be part two of a two-part series where we kind of laid the foundations in part one. So if you, if this is your first time uh, coming to the podcast and you are hearing this and it says part two, go check out part one um, and then jump back into part two. So I am really excited to talk to Sherry again today as we really unpack understanding trauma and abuse. So welcome to the show, Sherry. Thank you, Mally. It's good to be here with you. Yeah. And we're not too far apart. We're about 90 miles from one another. So yeah, I can um, get to you when I need to. That's right. That's right. So Sherry and I got to know each other a number of years ago as we were walking with some women collaboratively. And she's an incredible resource. So much wisdom that she provides not only me, but so many of the, the people that she works with. So Sherry, for those that don't know, actually, let's just go on and take a deep dive into your story. Um, you, you talked a little bit about it last week in part one, but love for you to just share a little bit more about who you are and how you came into the work that you do today. But let's go into that backstory and share with our listeners who, who Sherry Tate is. Yeah, I was thinking about how to enter the story because it's, <laughs> it's so hard to find in a lot of our stories exactly where to enter in to make sense when you're telling somebody so many years of um, how we get to this place in our life. And I think one thing I'd like to say is a lot of my life as a as a young mother, I would pray and pray and pray that the Lord would bring my sons to himself mm -hmm. and that they would know the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so I, I never dreamed that that prayer would actually materialize as my life as a mother of teenagers began to fall apart and my boys actually saw God rescuing me from a horrible situation and giving them insight into what who God is, the rescue of God, and what he can do in a life. He's that my son saw me go from such destruction to I, I would call abundant life. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a hard journey to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Sherry, let's go, let's go back and maybe even look under the hood a little bit more at maybe what your your childhood looked like. As we talk about story, so much of our story of, of adulthood is unpacking some of our story from growing up as a child. So talk a little bit about that, where you lived and yeah, I grew up in Selma, Alabama, and there are a lot of good things and there are a lot of hard things. And so some of the hard things is that I experienced sexual abuse at an early age that went on for many years. Mm -hmm. And um, that went into some promiscuity at an early age, at age 14, and drinking to cover up pain. And then when I was 19, I had a sister that was killed in a car wreck. Then I went to the University of Alabama and I graduated with a degree in, in public relations. And I think what I've learned through all this is that we get comfortable or familiar with environments that we've lived in. And so, so many times a woman will continue to re-victimize herself, entering into relationships that are more comfortable to, in what she was used to than knowing how to choose a healthy relationship to live the rest of her life in. So I think that um, I'd like to focus on my marriage when I was 45. I, that is the marriage that I learned a lot about abuse and how to come out of abuse and trauma. And so I met this man. I started dating him and we dated for maybe five or six months. There were so many red flags, but I think the main thing was that I was a very, very lonely woman. I was a single mother with two sons, 12 and 14. I was working full time and just really lived in band-aid theology. And when I say that, I mean that we put a band-aid, a scripture over a deep, deep wound and we just keep going thinking that the band-aid is going to suffice 
but in my forties, I was in a lot of emotional pain. I didn't understand any of my story according to the biblical narrative. And I, I was really dying inside, even though I looked on the outside, like I had it all together and everything. I was fine. That was my mantra. I'm sure many women listen, listening will understand that. I am fine. I am fine. When, you know, I'm dying inside. And so I was at Panera Bread one day and it was very, very crowded with a lot of people. And a man, I was with a friend and we're sitting at a bistro table. So I was kind of raised up a little bit from the other tables. And a man walked in from the far end of Panera and he just really made a beeline for me. And he he came straight to the table and he began to just talk casually and then ask a lot of questions. And he wrote a book called Reversing Fibromyalgia. And I actually was working in the industry of physical therapy and I was developing a program for fibromyalgia with a um, a heated pool in the, in the building. And so as he began to talk about, he wrote a book, that was his claim to fame. He wrote a book on reversing fibromyalgia. Then it really pierced my ears and I began to listen because I was really having some problems figuring this thing out. And so he told me about the book. And when we were finished the conversation, he knew where I worked, finished the conversation. I went to Books A Million right next door and there it was on the shelf. And so I bought it and I read it and I thought it was brilliant. And so the next couple of weeks, he began to call me and um, I wasn't interested in anything romantic. I just wanted to talk to him about fibromyalgia and learn. But he kept calling and calling and being very kind and um, very attentive to me. And so he asked me one day about six weeks later if I would like to go to coffee that afternoon. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. It was Friday. And so I said yes. And so I left my office and I went to Panera and we sat and drank coffee. And he was so delightful. He was so delightful, very charismatic in personality, very attentive to me. I think that's the most important thing very attentive to me, asking questions about me, like, what do you like? And I would just stop and almost laugh and cry at the same time because I never had anybody ask me that before. What do you like? What's your favorite color? What do you like to do in your spare time? What do you like to read? And so it was very intriguing to my lonely soul. So At the end of the coffee, he asked me to go to dinner the next day, and I did. The next night, I went to dinner, and then slowly, he just began to um, call a lot and ask me to do things a lot. The first sign that something was really wrong, it was a red flag, and I had no idea what to do with these red flags. So I invited him to dinner about, I don't know, a couple of months after I started dating him to meet my boys. And that my boys had never met him until that time. And he came to dinner and we had a lovely time. He was very attentive to my boys. And when he left, I walked back into my bedroom and he had placed three dress shirts in my closet. (laughs) I was like, what are these shirts doing here? Was he marking his territory already? Yes, exactly. But, you know, I didn't understand all that. I knew it was strange, but I didn't understand it. Until many years later, just to move forward a week or so later, he came for dinner again. He put a few more things in my closet, the master closet. Just And finally, one one morning early at seven o'clock in the morning, he always was at Panera drinking coffee. At seven in the morning, I took all of his clothes and I drove to Panera and I put all of his clothes on top of his car. And I said, do not call me again. I cannot have your clothes in my car. I don't know what this means, but I want no part of it. Do not call me again. And, and y'all are dating. Off. We're not married. Right. We're just dating. Yeah. Wow. And I drove off. And I have to say that weeks went by and he began to call again. And one day, one Saturday morning, I was in my house with my sons. And in one of our conversations, I told him that I liked red crepe myrtles. A certain color, a very distinct color of crepe myrtles. We were just, I was just saying what I liked. And this Saturday morning at 6.30 in the morning, I looked outside and he is in my front yard 
digging holes for some crepe myrtles that he bought. And I opened the door and I walked outside and I said, what are you doing? And I can remember this. I mean, it's just so weird and wild. He started smiling at me and he walks towards my front door with hot Starbucks coffee. And he said, I brought this to you. And I just went off into this place of being mesmerized and said, well, come on in, let's drink coffee. And then I just got pulled right back into that vortex. Can you talk any more about maybe just some of the red flags? You're, you're in this dating relationship with this guy. So many mixed messages. You know, mm-hmm. he's he's doing some things that are setting some alarms off, but yet there's this love bombing, we call it love mm-hmm. bombing, that feels like care. He brought mm-hmm. you hot Starbucks. He's planting your favorite plant in the yard. He's, you know, he's intelligent. He's probably got all the words. And many times we get lost in all that because they, they're, they're great at words and intelligence. But what were some additional red flags for you that you saw? And ultimately, you know, you talk about marrying him, but just, yeah, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, he was, he immediately started wanting to spend all his time with me and me with him. So to a lonely woman, that is very soothing. Mm -hmm. And so we just began to date. And the third day that we were dating, he told me he loved me and he demanded that I tell him I love him. And so I did. And then we just went to this whirlwind affair of dinner. And he's a as he's a doctor of education. So he used his titles to really present a person that he was not. He was a doctor of education, but he would use that in the realm of telling people that he was a doctor and that he could help them medically. And there's just so many things that like were really very grandeurless grandiose thinking Mm -hmm. and I believed him and I just thought he was the smartest man I'd ever met we had such intelligent conversations but most a lot of those things that grandiose thinking I began to see like I could see some like wait a minute you said this one day and you said this the other day like which one is it Mm -hmm. and there was a lot of lying and that I didn't understand. And yeah, I just didn't even question him. I think earlier in my life, I was, I was taught that we don't ask questions. And so I was still very much in that mindset. My curiosity was gone. I didn't have any, even when I met him, because to not have curiosity is a survival mode. Like if I'm going to survive this, I can't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't ask questions. And I just believed him. I had people, when I announced that we were going to get married, many people tried to stop me. I would not listen. I believed that they did not understand how wonderful this was. And so I married him with two children, thinking because he told me that he was going to start paying my house payment. And he would say it with all such, you know, charismatic wording that it wasn't it was so smooth like I never asked him to pay my house payment but he just wove that into to a place where wow he's gonna he's gonna take care of me and the boys and take care of me and the boys he told me that he knew that like you know I was a single mom that I worked hard and that he had was going to start a fund to to fund the boys college and he would call me one day and say, I'll be there soon. I've got to go by the bank. I've got five accounts and I need to switch some money around. And so, I was, okay. And so eventually I found out that he had no money. There was no way he could pay for my college, my son's college. And after we got married, I kept paying the house payment for months until one day I just said, I thought you were going to pay the house payment. And he was offended. It was very crazy making, chaotic in in the way the relationship was going. I never had a I never could get my 
feet grounded in something because it was always changing. And he wanted it to change because that was the way of creating dominance and control over me. He had to have me always off balance instead of me being grounded where we could logically have conversations and walk together. I always had to be off balance. Mm. Um, I love the word that you said, off balance. It's mm-hmm. such that's such a visual when you're married to somebody with all the crazy making. Yeah. Because you never, again, you just, it's it's almost like you're just, you, you can't ever get settled. Um, there, and, you, and you're thinking all the time, well, maybe if I say it this way, or maybe if I communicate this way, or maybe I didn't explain that right. You know, you're just constantly, it's, it's exhausting. I'll just try to say it different one more time and he'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and there is no end to that. It took nine years for me to figure out that he had me where he wanted me. And I was so broken down after nine years that I could barely even, I tell people that I was knocked out in the ring. I couldn't get up. And that's the truth. I, 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 I could not get up off the floor by myself. That's an analogy. And in actuality, that actually did happen at the end. I was on the floor. Well, so much of it, it is psychological, correct? So psychological. Yes. It sounds like, Sherry, speak a little bit to this. It sounds like he was a little more over. There's, there's, there's a lot of co- covert that is very problematic, but then there's also more overt behaviors. Oh, yeah. So talk a little bit about the difference of those. Yeah, he was, he, he was, he is a very charismatic personality. So you like him the minute he walks in the room. He's just very, very warm and charismatic and knows how to in, endear you to him. So the covert in his intelligence he was so calculating. He knew it was a chess game all the time where he knew where he wanted me to go in his mind and under his control. And so he could, he could, he could wait a long time to slowly get me to the place where it was. And, you know, I'd like to tell about the story that was horrifying for me. This is the, probably one of the most horrifying things that happened. And that was, there was a lot of covert I mean, over physical, the first in the first three months, after three months, he grabbed my neck and choked me for the first time. And I realized that, well, wait, this is this is scary. Like there's something here that's scary. I didn't think about myself. Mm -hmm. I the first thing I thought about was my children are going to get hurt here. And I began to say, oh, my goodness, this he cannot hurt my children. And so. He was always telling me that he was going to take care of the boys. He loved the boys. You know, he was their father. I mean, he's going to be a good stepfather, not their father. They have a father and a good father, but a stepfather. And so one day, you know, boys will be boys. And so they're being loud in the house. They have friends over and he just had to have it quiet. And he got very demanding. And one day he was upset with me about something. And I always try to tiptoe around so that he wouldn't get upset with the boys. So he, I'd rather him get upset with me, but not the boys. So I was always in the middle. And um, one day he wanted them to be quiet and they were just being boys. They weren't even being loud. They were just existing in the house. Mm-hmm. And so he kept telling them to be quiet and, and they would whisper or something. And I was outside and they came outside with me and he was chasing them. He just really lost control. and and he was chasing them outside with a knife. A, I mean, a big knife, a big knife. And he was shaking it, screaming at them. And it was so scary that I just brought them into myself in the backyard and I tried to calm and he calmed down a little bit. He went inside and I was like, okay, I'm going to go get the keys and we're going to leave. And so we left, we left the scene and we, I took the boys um, downtown and we talked about it. And about an hour later, my phone rang. And of course, he was so kind and saying, please come back. He might have said, I'm sorry at that point. I don't remember another time he said he was sorry ever to me, but I think he might have when it was concerning the boys. And he knew that I was not going to come back. Well, he taught me into coming back. And I had to tell the boys that we were going back and it was going to be fine. That he was, he said he would never do it again. And so that cycle continued until I realized that I needed to get the boy safe 
And so one summer they went to live with their dad in Florida. And that whole summer I prayed and cried, literally laid on the floor with my face into the carpet, begging God to make this right. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. And after two weeks of begging and praying and crying, I realized that I I was going to have to let the boys go. I mean, I'd never even thought about me going really at that point. Mm. I don't even know why. I just thought that I married him and I had to stay there, but I couldn't let the boys stay in that danger. And so I did. I, I got off the floor and I realized that, that their father was the safest place for them to be. And so I talked to their father about it and he agreed and I packed their clothes up and everything up in their rooms. And I, I drove it down to Florida and I helped them get settled in school and get their rooms settled and just really didn't make it to be a big deal. Using that band-aid theology that everything's fine and we're just going to cover this wound. And then, um, I drove back home and they started school the next day. And when I got back home, I began to have a nervous breakdown, mainly because they're 12 and 14. I never, ever dreamed that marrying him would separate me from my sons. Like that never crossed my mind. I thought that he was going to make our life better and that we would be able to provide better for the boys and more stable home. And um, all of a sudden we were separated. He told you were me holding it together in Florida, taking care of them. And it was almost like you, you collapsed when you got home. Totally collapsed. I think that, um, this will be a good time to show that clipping, okay. that clip. And I sh- can, I, I just want to tee the clip up a little bit. Yeah. So the Lord has made our bodies to have a protective system. Mm-hmm. And when we are in danger, our bodies are made to protect us and to warn us that we're in danger. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot to this subject and we're not going to get into all this, but basically we have a, um, a nervous system that when there is danger around, it sets itself up for fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. And there's a lot to say about all those, but the video that we're about to show is about a collapse. And I realized that most of my life I had lived in, in collapse mode. And so collapse is when we are in a place that we're powerless, we're helpless. We think we have no options and we cannot get out of the danger. And this is what our body does. So for those of you that are not able to see this, why don't you explain what just happened? Because there are going to be people that, that are not watching the video of this on YouTube. They're going to be listening to Apple Podcasts. So talk about that collapse. Yeah, so our body, when, when we are helpless, powerless, and have no options, um, our body literally goes into a place of collapse. And it's like realizing in our nervous system that there is no way out. And so we saw from that video that the cougar had the deer and was holding the deer down. And the deer's face and eyes were still, just completely still, frozen in fear. And then we saw the cougar kind of playing around, like teasing with him or, you know, taunting him. And then we saw the hyena come. And it startled the cougar so that the cougar felt like he was now in danger. So he ran off and left the deer in the field. And the deer is is playing dead. So I guess we go back to just thinking about ourselves or a woman in a fearful situation. She is literally playing dead. And even when all the taunting comes and even some physical violence or psychological violence or spiritual violence, they utter not a word. Mm. And so when when the danger is over, the body, the deer's body, has to sit in the field for a while and realize that the danger is over. They are actually safe now. 
and we saw the deer begin to, at first, the deer was not breathing. Mm-mm. Like the body is totally shut down. And then after 15 seconds, you see the deer slowly begin to take a breath, take a breath. And then you see the deer begin to shake. Mm-hmm. So you're seeing the, the central nervous system coming back online and holding and experiencing and, and feeling the trauma of what just happened. And so that we, and so they're shaking uncontrollably. And so we see that with women, we see our body shake, we see our stomach shake, we see our central nervous system begin to do things that we cannot stop. We're shaking all over. And Peter Levine is a, a, a man that studies this. And he says that the trauma, the shaking is actually what, what helps remove the trauma from our body. Mm-hmm. So we can see that nature goes through the full trauma cycle. It goes through collapse, then it goes through not breathing, then slowly starting to breathe, and then shaking and shaking, 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 and then able to stand up and run off as if nothing happened. But what happens to humans is that we do not go through the sit, the process that God has set our body up. And so we don't ever really, we usually go into collapse and we usually stay there for many, many years until a therapist or somebody can come along beside you and start going back in that trauma. And you literally can see in trauma work, like the body begins to shake. Yeah. And we see the, the lady being able to work through the trauma, trauma in her emotions and bodily, mm-hmm. and then um, be able to stand up and walk away. Maybe not like nothing ever happened to her, but she is able to return to a functional life um, with some scars. So I just love that video. When I first yeah. saw it for the first time, I just bawled my eyes out because I actually saw what had happened to me for many, many years and I never understood it. And it was so good to see it in science. Like this is how God created my body. Like I'm not weird or someone with 10 heads. Literally, I went into my body, went into collapse in some trauma and I was still holding on to it until somebody could come along and help me work through it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think today, you know, Sherry with, you know, until a counselor or until a woman reads something or can, you know, thank goodness we're, we live in, in the world of technology today where we can get a podcast yeah. or we can get a YouTube video and we can actually find a name to put a voice to what we know is happening that sometimes we can't put a voice to. And, Absolutely. and, and I, and I love that video too, that really shows the, 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 the deep places I mean, the head just flopped on the deer, you know, just literally yeah. flopped when the leopard or whatever it was, you know, let go of it. Like it was totally limp and dead. And yeah. and I think about, I, I like to sometimes play devil's advocate, you know, while we're having these conversations, because for the woman that may not even recognize what's going on, or my husband doesn't hit me, or my husband doesn't run outside with a knife after my kids. Again, they're more overt behaviors. And then they're are covert behaviors that sometimes I believe are even more destructive because to the, to the, to your face, it can look like, Oh, I love you. And I'm going to care for you and all these promises and love bombing and all that. And then behind the back or, or maybe in the public, that's what it looks like. And then behind closed doors, it's complete opposite. It can, it can even be silence, disregard, dismissal, broken promises, correction upon correction upon correction, just lots of different things. And you just wait, he loves me when he doesn't love me. What he's, he compliments me in public, but he criticizes me, criticizes me in in private, just, and it just really messes with you. So talk a little bit about that. I know you walk with a lot of domestic, uh, a lot of women that are in domestic violence as well. Talk a little bit about what that looks like from a more covert place. Yeah. So I I have an example that I can give you from my own story. After we were married for a couple of months, he he had separated me from every person I know, like every support person, every friend. Um, he would tell me that they were um, that, that they weren't safe people, that they he would basically tell me that they were 
unhealthy and that we could not participate with them. That's what he would say. They're unhealthy. We cannot compromise our faith. And so we can't participate with this person, that person, until eventually I was very lo- alone and a captive of my own house with him all the time. And so I didn't see my parents a lot. I didn't see my parents for years. And so one day I, I, I woke up and it was going to be, it was July 3rd. And I just got really, really brave. And I said to him in a very assertive way with so much fear, intimidation, intimidation, trepidation in my being, but out with my words, I said, I think I'm going to go see my parents today. And he said, okay. And I was like, wow. Okay. And so I started getting dressed. And so he went in the kitchen and he, he fixed me a little to go baggy and water. And then when I was ready, he, he walked me out to my car and put, I can remember he, he put the seatbelt over me and, you know, just wanted me to be safe and drive careful. I was like, okay. And so I drove off and I thought, wow, maybe I've just, you know, made this, maybe I've just imagined this all these years. Maybe I've been he's not a monster. Them. Yeah, he's not a monster. And so I go to my parents and I visit them and I come back in the afternoon and um, he's so happy to see me. And so we had a great afternoon, cooked together and everything. Everything's fine. And the next day in the morning, he said, hey, um, I'd like to take you to lunch. And I was like, okay. He said, why don't you get dressed and, um, and we'll go to lunch at this special place. And so I did. We, we drove there. We got there. I was, we were standing in line waiting for some the waitress to come get us to our table. And he, he laid down in my ear. He was behind me and he was like being very affectionate and rubbing my shoulders and just very connected. And he leaned down in my ear and he said, remember, I told you that there's consequences for disobedience. I was, yeah, I remember. And I mean, just fear went through me. I didn't have any idea what he was talking about. We walked, we got seated, we walked to this table. We nothing was said. Every he just we went on like just nothing. Had a a nice conversation, you know, talked to the people around us. And I'm my stomach's or my stomach is inside out. Like what in the world does he mean? So we got home and I was sitting in my chair, he's sitting in his chair, everything's peaceful. And um he, he said, Hey, would you order my vitamins that um I really want to start taking those vitamins again. So I said, sure. So I went on Amazon. I ordered the vitamins and I got an email quickly after I ordered them that said there was something wrong with the order. And so I went into the order and it said that um, it was, there was something wrong with the payment. And so I did it again. I mean, I knew that my, there was plenty of money in there and, and it would, I did it like three or four times. It would not go through. That was strange to me. So I went into my bank account and I, I looked up my bank account. I logged in and it said that it had been closed. And I looked over at him still. I still didn't understand. And I said, did you know that my bank account was closed? And he just looked over at me and smiled and said, I told you there were consequences for disobedience. And so after that, he left every day at seven in the morning. We only had one car. He took me down to one car so I would be dependent on him. And he left the house, which he never did this, every day for three weeks and left me in the house. He said he had to go somewhere all day long by myself with no money because my checking account was closed. No people. He knew I wasn't going to tell anybody. And it was utter torment. It was actually being, it was like being terrorized. Sometimes they won't leave the house. Sometimes they lock you out of accounts. You know, anything to keep you in a place of powerlessness, helplessness. Those are signs of domestic violence, correct? Sometimes it's overt. Sometimes it's covert, very passive. But to put you in a very vulnerable, helpless state where then he can come in and be the hero, correct? Yeah, it's kind of like I really could liken it to um, the Stockholm syndrome. And after I got out of the marriage, um, I could see it was real similar to Elizabeth Smart story. Mm-hmm. And I know those are so extreme, but I was 
isolated for nine years in my house. I had a lady walk by my house. People walk by our house all the time. And years later, I became friends with Dina Hodge, this, this girl in a church. And she was at, she was telling me one day, she said, um, I just went walking. I said, well, where'd you walk? And she said, I walked down Old Farm. And I said, oh, Old Farm? I used to live on Old Farm. And she said, where? And I just stopped for a second and I went, I counted. I said, the fifth house on the left. And she went, oh, oh my gosh, you're the woman in the window. And I said, I just stopped for a second and I didn't even have to ask her. And I said, yes, I'm the woman in the window. And she told me that every day for years, her and a friend walked by my house and prayed that her, that woman's husband, that she would get released from that her husband. They need, they could see that I was in bondage in the house. Oh. And I was just sitting on the sofa reading or just mostly reading is what I did. And they could see me every day in the window, just sitting there all day long, just, yeah. But God answered the prayer and I'm so thankful. And yeah, Dana and I are very good friends today. Amazing yeah. that this woman who didn't even know you could, could feel that and to pray for you. And just what a, what a redeeming part of your story is God rescue, rescued you out of that relationship. Um, from the prayers of women that didn't even know you. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Melanie, I got to think of, what was your last question? Because I feel like we, I got covert. What are some, we, I think it's it's important to talk about what are some additional behaviors that, you know, somebody in domestic violence may not even know they're in domestic violence, you know, like the closing accounts, locking you out of things, not having a car, you know, all those. I think it's important because, Again, there's there's overt, but the covert, I think, is what so many Christian women are struggling with because it's like, wait, he provides for me until he doesn't. You know, he is loving and kind and says all the words until he's not. Another thing that um, I think is so important to know some of these red flags and even to be able to understand what covert abuse is, covert meaning covered up, Um is when you know everything's good and it seems like everything's going fine and then um there's an undercurrent that you just can't quite put your finger on but you know that you're walking on eggshells and you're staying in the house and trying to do everything to help um him not blow up or explode um one way i think that abusers do that is they use they use the scripture so there's spiritual abuse going on when the woman it seems so um comforting and so uh, safe to be in the word with a husband that is wanting to teach her and pray with her and one thing that i experienced was that he would have me in the word three and four hours a day and at first that was very comforting to me because I love the Lord, and I was told later that he was exploiting my relationship with the Lord, mm -hmm. and I did not understand that, but he was exploiting me in a place that was very sensitive to the Lord. When I realized that that some things were really wrong and I needed we needed to get some help, I wanted us to get help. I still thought that it was a marriage problem, mm -hmm. and so I would I began to read books about it wasn't about trauma and abuse. It was just more about theology and suffering and growing, like repentance, what that looks like. And so whatever I would learn, I would go to him and say, oh, this is what we need. We we really probably don't know, understand how to, you know, do, do biblical repentance. And so this is what that looks like. And he was like, yeah, I really want to learn that. And so we began to study that together. And Everything that I took to him that was really helping me and helped me move towards him and I wanted to be healthy in that relationship. Within time, I realized that he was learning everything that I was talking about and then he was turning it and using it as a weapon against me. Yes. 
and even telling other people that I would reach out to to try to get help from. He would use the language that I had given him to help us and turn it on me. Mm -hmm. And Melody, I left so many times. I could not get away from this man. And finally, I really realized finally that I was in an addiction. And I didn't understand that at first. I just thought that I was trying, I just, you know, was stay in a marriage because the Bible told me to. I would get in First Peter 3 where it says that we are to win our husband over by a quiet and gentle spirit. And so I stayed in that scripture for years and years because I was trying to obey the Lord and knowing the Lord that would take care of that in time. And I stayed away from my sons for years and years on that scripture, thinking if I, he said to me, he would say to me, Sherry, if you stay under my covering, you know, like under my wing, I've got you right here. You're safe here. If you stay under my covering, then you will be safe. But if you come out of my covering and do things that are against scripture, the Lord will not protect your children. And so you need to stay here. And so I took that seriously and I would stay there on behalf of protecting my children from something that they may have to endure because I did not obey the Lord. Hmm. So spiritual abuse is a horrific thing. And I think that that is a more covert type of abuse. It's very, very covered up. And until the Lord begins to teach you in the middle of that, that he's twisting scripture. He's not applying scripture as the Lord would. He's applying scripture to your life to build his kingdom and to keep you where he wants you. And so until I began to see that, I stayed wanting to obey God. So we know that it takes a woman time and time again before she has the courage to leave. And I'm, I want you to share the statistic because I think it's really, really important. Yeah, so um, I would go to, uh, I would have to leave we get so bad that I would have to leave. I just couldn't handle it one more minute. And several times I went to the Sunshine Center, which is our local domestic violence shelter for women. And I learned there, they did some, uh, they were training us on what domestic violence looked like. I couldn't even call it domestic violence at first. I just, I just knew that we couldn't get along and I would take half the responsibility or even all the responsibility. And one day I learned at the Sunshine Center that women in these relationships, these dominating and controlling relationships, on the national average, they'd leave seven times before they're able to stay for good. And what that means is that they will leave one time. And when they leave, they, they learn a little bit about what's going on, but they're not strong enough to stay or do it, go on and be, you know, live life on their own. So they return back to the home and then they get to a place a little while later where they can't, they can't stand anymore. So they leave again. And when they leave, they get a little bit further out than, than when the first time they left, but they understand a little bit more. And then he begins to um, coerce her back into coming back. So she goes back, but when she gets back, she knows more than when she left. And so she can't stay long because when it starts, she has some understanding. And so she leaves again. And average, national average is that she'll leave seven times before she is strong enough to leave for good. Yeah. And I mean, I can tell you, I was in a cycle that was so horrific that I left probably more than 25 times and I always, always returned. And after I got out for good, I realized, I mean, I really think the Lord just showed me this, that I was, I was involved in an addiction. I was addicted to a place that seemed safe for me when it was good, seemed secure when it was good. I was seen when it was good, but when it went into the explosive stage, it was just so horrible. And then I got in. I got involved in the cycle of abuse. So a cycle of abuse is when there's a honeymoon stage where everything's good. And then tension starts building. And so we begin to walk on eggshells. We begin to say, what can I do to, you know, make everything right? I begin to take responsibility for why he's getting angry. 
and I just walked so tense in the home. And then finally he explodes and there's an event. And that is, you know, and the explosion part of the cycle. And when that's over, he realizes that the victim is about to leave or she just can't stand that anymore. So he immediately goes back into a honeymoon stage. Mm. And the addiction is to the honeymoon stage. Mm. We get addicted to the places where it's good and we are safe and seen and secure. Um, and in reality, under, we're really never <laughs> safe and seen and secure. Right. All under a false guise. Yeah. It's false. It's not a true uh, reality. It's a fantasy world that we live in. And then, well, um, and it, it's, it's, but we don't know that it is, you know, we think it's reality. And I right. believe, and I believe what, what's also difficult for Christian women is when it, when it's weaving in our value system, you know, marriage, oh. our kids, like there, I don't know of one woman that wakes up one day and says, I want to be divorced from my husband. You know, I want right. to break my family apart, you right. know? And so it, it, it's this duplicity within a woman of, I cannot stay, he is destroying me from the inside out. Yet my kids, my life, my marriage, you know, it's, 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 it's extreme. And, you know, again, if you're not even in a work situation where you can provide for yourself, you, you feel that sense of helplessness, hopelessness too. <laughs> yeah. Right. And interestingly enough, um, Melody, when I would leave, I would, I would go to pastors. <clears throat> I would every, I reached out for so much help. I went to five pastors, every pastor over a nine year period told me to go home and submit. They took Ephesians 5 and they twisted it and sent me back into harm's way. And I knew something was wrong, but I could not find anybody to begin to talk to me about trauma and abuse and domestic violence in the home. I could not find anybody. Um, I had one of the, the pastor that I, we were in this church for a long time and my husband was a deacon in this church. And I went to him for help three times and it had gotten really, really bad. And finally, one day he looked at me in the face and he said, Sherry, I want you to go home and stay in your lane mm -hmm. and you are not give it. And I really, all five times that a pastor told me that, I, I went back home and submitted thinking I can do this. This is what the mandate of God is for me. I go back. And finally, after nine years, I got introduced to a man named Chris Moles and Chris Moles is a pastor um, that is also a biblical counselor and through having a situation in his church where a woman came in about 1030 on a Sunday morning, she was black and blue mm -hmm. and she was asking him to help her. She didn't, she didn't even know what she needed. She was just beaten to a pulp and he was about to go into the pulpit and he said, I've got to go preach, but I want you to go to the the police station and file a report. So she left and he went and preached. And he said, as he stood in that pulpit preaching, the conviction of God came on him. And that he began to see that instead of preaching that day, he needed to turn it over to somebody else and to assist her to that police station and help that woman. Yeah. Well, out of that, you know, doing it wrong and hurting a woman, he began to learn how to do it right. He he began to study domestic violence and how he could help women in his area. And so now he's become a a man in the church, a pastor in the church that advocates for women on a broad platform. Mm -hmm. And so I was introduced to Chris Moles. He's the first person that I ever heard talk about domestic violence in the church and the cover up and the church's response for a woman to go home and submit. And he then led me to a curriculum called Mending the Soul that I was very scared to do because I did not want to be psychologized as the church would say. Yeah. And after many months of him telling me he wanted me to just push me in that direction, I, I did go into that curriculum and learned it myself. And so 
the way out was that I began to be, study domestic violence and bring people around me, the Lord bringing people around me that understood it and helped me. Hmm. What a what a cool story that you found him, you know, that yeah. you were able to get that curriculum and you were able to see what for the first time. I mean, like we we know there's something going on, but we can't put words to it. But it sounds like he was able to articulate and put words to what you were feeling and seeing and experiencing. Yeah. And I, I felt like for the first time I was not crazy. The first time somebody other than me was putting into words what I could not. And I think all of my study in Malady and the way, the things that I've learned, if I could put that in a nutshell, it was that God began to give me vocabulary for what I had no words for. I could not communicate it because I didn't have any words. So as I studied, I began to get vocabulary and then I began to put my story into a linear line where it made began to make sense to me through the grid of scripture. Yeah. Through the grand narrative, you know, we enter this earth realm in the fall and there's lots of suffering. And then God just begins, keeps growing us till we get to a place that we are coming out of the suffering and we're learning more about ourselves and more about God. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, and there's two thoughts that I had when you were sharing that, Sherry. One, people that don't understand, like I'm so glad again that you got with Chris, but an abuser that continues to abuse in a situation like that, where you finally find somebody that can put words to what you know is going on. Your body knows it, your head knows it, even if you can't articulate it, but an abuser will would say something along the lines of, well, see, you just found somebody to agree with you. Right. Instead of, I finally found somebody to put a name to what I've been going through for so long. And um, so I think that's really important for a woman who, who may finally find somebody that can vocalize what she's experiencing. And you may have some people, pockets, ministers in your life to say, this is a marriage problem, or, you know, you're just trying to find somebody to agree with you. Like, these are not marriage problems. Abuse is not a marriage problem. A abuse is a character problem that creates marriage issues. And I think that's important to say as well. I wish Chris could sit in front of every minister, but sounds like I'll be podcasting him. <laughs> oh my gosh. He, he would educate so all awesome. of us. Oh yeah. He's, he's taught me so much. I'm forever indebted to Chris Falls, Diane Langberg, Dan Allender, Pete Scazzaro. Yes. These people that we have access to um, in this day and time through technology. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you finally get a, vo a voice. Yeah. And what does that look like? Yeah, that is really <laughs> interesting because <clears throat> the path thought, doesn't get easy after that, right? No. I mean, like I was, I thought that when, if I got healthier, that we could be healthier. Yeah. But what happened was actually the opposite. And I realized later, as I look back, that the healthier that I got, the worse it, it was in the home. And he would rather me be sick and taking care of me than for me to be well, healthier, and us to have some good days. I mean, a lot of good days ahead of us. So um, the hell, I would just, I know that the healthier we get in any kind of abusive relationship, we're going to get tremendous pushback. And tremendous pull to come back to where you were before. And so when I got healthier, he called that unhealthy. Yep. And that is such a battle in your mind because he would say things to me that made perfect sense. Like, you're moving away from me. I, you, I don't feel con emotionally connected to you, but I was just having to learn how to protect myself. And eventually, he divorced me, which is really interesting. Hmm. Like I wanted to get us help. And eventually he divorced me. I had one man actually confront him and call. I, I prayed the whole marriage. Like, Lord, would you have one person actually confront him and bring him to a place of repentance? Like nobody's willing to do this. And I just kept praying to the Lord. And at the very end, one counselor got in his face and told him he was never to do this to me again. 
and called into repentance. And after we got out of that counseling session, he looked at me and he said, I will never submit to what he says. He was a he was a spiritual head, but my ex-husband said that I will never do that. And so for me to get healthy exposed him more and more. As long as I was around people that could see what unhealthy looked like. Mm -hmm. Truly. That's so good. So he finally divorced you. He divorced me. Mm -hmm. And usually that comes with more raking through the coals. Right. Yeah, I had actually separated from him and I was in the I was going to divorce him. Mm -hmm. Um, but his his papers came first and I was to me that it made it easy for me to just sign the papers and say, you know, I didn't divorce him. I don't know why that was important at that time. Yeah. But for some strange reason it was. And you know, to talk about this divorce issue, like this is we could have a whole podcast talking about divorce, the scriptures about divorce, and how the church has taken that and kept women in bondage when there's a lot of nuancing and unpacking the scriptures where it basically, God gives us divorce as a protection for women. And to unpack that is, is so freeing for a woman that is bound to a marriage because God hates divorce to hear all the other maybe we'll do an episode on separation and divorce i think it would be really helpful because you know in a in a one-liner god does not value marriage over the sanctity of a life ever and that's that's what the church has done you know it's all about reconciliation it's all about you know marriage which that is a sacred space marriage in in a case of abuse or abandonment addiction that's not, again, these are not marriage issues. These are issues that create um, marriage problems. And so, yeah, maybe we can definitely unpack that. I think at some point it would be helpful. So, yeah. Well, what would you say to a woman who might be in this scenario? You have just exposed some things or maybe named some things that she finally is getting in touch with. Oh my gosh, that's me. What would you say to her right now? I think that the way that I began to understand what I was in for the first time was I began, I heard somebody talking about their suffering story as opposed to their sin story. So mm-hmm. a sin story is what, what the church normally sits in, where we're constantly responsible and taking, you know, being responsible for what's going on in our, in our household. And we certainly have a sin story and we can deal with that. But this particular issue is... And we have certainly sinned in the marriage, but this particular issue is actually a suffering story. And so in order to become all God created us to be, which is what we're responsible for, is to understand the suffering story as well and to begin to understand what I am responsible for and what I'm not responsible for Mm -hmm. and begin to, I have done a lot of story work, which means that I've had counselors help me to go back into my story and see it in some particulars and be able to see some dynamics that were very difficult and be able to put a name to it. And doing that work actually is a way that frees my heart and my mind um, to be able to let go of a lot of my self-contempt and scourging myself. So I would encourage a woman to begin to think about what we call doing your work. And doing your work means that we set ourselves aside. We don't look at the husband or the marriage. And we just start looking at who am I? Who is God? What is he expecting of me? And what is he actually giving me freedom from that I don't even know I have freedom from? Hmm. I begin to study the theology of suffering. I begin to study the theology of oppression. Hmm. That God comes to the to the um, minimized and marginalized and he brings freedom it's all through the scripture the oppressed and the oppressor and how god hates the ways of the oppressor and is has come to give set the oppressed free and just to really take time maybe even 
years to begin to study that and learn what I'm responsible for to God and begin to yield to that instead of yielding to the slavery and bondage that I'm in within relationships. Mm. So good. So, so good. And I just, I want to affirm what you just said that Mm. you don't, if, if you are in this space and there's been some aha moments through, through this podcast, you don't have to make a decision. In fact, any major life decisions, we say, wait, six, eight months, a year, Just sit in, you know, what you said, Sherry, and, you know, find a good counselor who's trauma informed, who can really speak to what you're going through and not try to blame you, you know, shame you, you know, tell you to submit to your husband, but who can really begin to unpack the places in your life. And I love how you talked about too, you were addicted to the cycle, you know, and, and I can relate to that so much. You're, You're addicted to the the kindness and the, when, when it's there and the um, love bombing and all that only to, to be back in a cycle of, of harm and hurt, you yeah. know, and then there's cover up with all the kind words again. So I can, I can definitely identify with that, but, you know, don't make any life decisions, do get some help and yeah. vet a counselor. If, if two, if two counseling appointments in, you begin to, you know, you, 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 you from a counselor, don't accept that, you know, find a counselor who's willing to, to go a long journey with you and really begin to, to dive deeper into your story so that you can get the strength to make whatever decision that you need to make. Yeah. I love, I love the way you say that I've learned I think it's three statements. So there is an invitation to be curious Mm -hmm. with no demand. Yes. That's so good. And so you know, there's an invitation to allow our awareness to come as God would bring awareness for us. In Ephesians 5, he says, awake, awake, awake from your sleep. Mm. So the awareness comes, you begin to see things differently. And then to be curious, to start studying. You don't even have to tell, um, you know, an abuser that you're studying. Just start being curious on your very own. Get some knowledge and some strength and some wording. And there's no demand, like there's no demand for you to leave today. There's no demand. You just do your work and let whatever happens is going to happen. I will say that Leslie Burnick says that one reason that would justify separation is when a woman's body begins to break down. And so a lot of women do not know that. So they just keep saying, keep saying their body's breaking down and they're not associating that to the environment they're in. But when a body, a a mother, a woman's body's breaking down emotionally, so stressed out, so anxious, panic attacks, heart palpitations, stomach hurting, high blood pressure, all of those are signs that she, her body is not enduring this environment very well at all. And that would be a reason to take take a break and separate for a little while. Another reason would be if the children are in the house and there is danger to the children. Justin Holcomb in his book, Is It My Fault? He's the first person I ever read that said that it is is the responsibility of a Christian mother to get her children to safety. So we think that we need to stay, stay, stay because of the children. Mm -hmm. And really, in fact, we need to protect the children at all costs. Mama bear. And I'm not advocating divorce. I'm not even advocating separation. I'm just saying when it is warranted, then we have to have permission to, to, to do what's warranted and to get ourselves and our children to safety. That's right. That's good. All right. Well, let's, we're going to circle back around to another episode at some point. I would love to talk about separation and divorce and bring in the scriptures and we can talk all about that. I think it's important. It's, it's all about educating and getting curious about things. It's not telling people what to do. It's like, hey, here's a conversation. Let's bring in all the all the pieces. And yeah. um, so let's finish with um, telling people how to get in touch with you, Sherry. You do some incredible work. Mention your ministry again, too. I don't think we brought that into this episode and how to get in touch with you. Yes. So um, I, I'm executive director of a ministry called Daughter by Design. And the ministry was actually uh, birthed out of my story. 
and we work with with women coming out of domestic violence, um, sexual abuse, and controlling and dominating relationships. And so it's a counseling ministry. I work um, by via Zoom all over the country, and you can get in touch with me by going on my website and filling out a contact information form. The website is www.daughterbydesign.org. Um, and I just want to say that is daughter, not doctors. It's, it's a singer for daughter by design. And my work every day is that I work with women that are recognizing and becoming aware that they are in a situation that's over their heads, that it's not a marriage problem, and they want education and women that want to do story work and begin to understand their own self and how they are addicted to a situation like this, going back into their childhood and through their teenage years, all the way up to their very current place and just bringing grace to that story. And yeah, just watching how the Lord can set us free from um, lies that we've believed all of our life life, and just returning a woman back to her original design. That is what we like to do. But I love how you fit, how you finish that up returning a woman back to original design, being faithful to herself. Yes, um, returning to herself and to God. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so well, in a nutshell, I say this. Thank you for sharing such vulnerable places in your story, Sherry. I, thank I'm, you. I'm grateful for the courage and the work that you've done that you can share that with us. Thank you for inviting me. This episode has been brought to you by Life Beyond Betrayal. Life Beyond Betrayal is a comprehensive program that provides a community as well as three courses for women. The first course is Surviving Trauma Beyond Betrayal. Our second course is called Grieving Beyond Betrayal. And the third course is called Reclaiming You Beyond Betrayal. This is a self-paced program that you can take as long as you want to go through and also provides a community so that you feel like you have the support that you need. So check out Life Beyond Betrayal membership at lifebeyondbetrayal.com.